For most folks, punching that archery elk tag can be a tough venture. Mile after mile, they never see an elk. Day after day, not even hearing an elk. Some folks hunt for years and just can't seem to put that proverbial piece of the puzzle together. On today's show, our next guest struggled for three years trying to figure out that puzzle. His story takes place hunting the Colorado archery season with an OTC tag in his pocket, hundreds of miles from his home in Arkansas, totally alone. New year. Will the third time be the charm? Welcome to our second edition of our Grinder Stories from Elk Camp, where we talk with everyday elk hunters just like you from all over the U.S. about their elk hunts. All the learning moments, the ups, the downs, steps, realizations, along with the hows and the whys, helping you learn from both their successes and their mistakes. That discussion, some Elk Bros shout outs, and questions from our awesome Elk Bros mailbox. So my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkGrows.com, with your host, Gilbert Ornelas, and elk hunting coach, Joe Gillian. You want to hunt elk? They live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons, doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello there, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy the show. And as always, for those blue collar hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host of your show, coming to you from Spring, Texas. And that's right. We've got one of the leaders of the Venezuelan Mafia with us from Katy, Texas, Luis Gonzalez. And the other leader of the Venezuelan mafia from the DFW area, Manano Graterón. That's right. The and others, we have our fitting. elk hunting coaches in the house tonight. We have the ninja, Leroy Chavez. And WWJGD, mm. what would Joe Gillia do is in the house and joining us at elk camp today. Let's give a warm elk bros welcome to tonight's guest. All the way from Springdale, Arkansas, the one, the only Mr. Stephen Richardson's in the house. Welcome, hey. brother. Thank you. What's going on, Woo-hoo. brother Stephen? Man, I, I like I like that title for Manano. He can be the other leader. I like it. I like it. That's perfect. I love it. The, the, the other. I'm just going to say we've got the mafia in the house and I'm not going to go names anymore. These guys get so butthurt if you do it the wrong way. Uh, yes. Yes. Listen, Manano. Yes. yes. Stephen, Stephen, all right. You hear it going on, man. We, okay. Uh, He's heard it as the show was being introduced to him. He heard it too. So, <laughs> Stephen, who, who's, who's the leader of the mafia, man? I've always Stephen heard Moore. it said that if you're that good, you don't have to tell anybody, just the silent assassin <laughs> getting it done. I I think I'm going to have to go with Manuel Graterón. Oh, <laughs> my <laughs> Lord. I, I like, like this guy. guy. I, I like, like this guy. guy. Look, oh, he, he even don't. toasted you, Stephen. That's I don't. I'm out. I'm not wasting an hour and a half here. I'm, <laughs> I'm, out. I'm out. I'm out, man. Good luck with your elk hunting, Stephen. He, yeah. <laughs> Luis is out. Yeah, that's right. Just go for it, man. That's awesome. Just, yeah. See you later. <laughs> you know, I do shoot heavy arrows, Luis. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah sure. Oh, you're dragging him back in now, Stephen. Sure. I promise. Sure. Well, you know, and, and we haven't had Luis with us now for what, one, two weeks. I mean, he's been shanking on us, man. So I was about to shank on you tonight, and I wish I would have now. <laughs> Uh, he's getting ready for a big hunt man so oh. i'm telling you i can't wait the, the film footage will be rolling in this weekend oh. himself and me and tomorrow. me and master logan will be perched up in a tree somewhere this weekend uh, the, the blood fixing to get shed this weekend i promise you and and i gotta say man after you know louise dude uh if there's any reason to not be here it was the awesome hunt you had with your family oh my gosh. last week was just phenomenal. I mean, the photos, the time, the smiles to see all three of your girls, man, in camo out there and getting it done. And, and it was just, man, just awesome. That was just awesome. It was priceless. It, it, it was, was priceless. And, and Luis, I know, uh, you know, I, I stayed in contact with him 
it, through some really tough, tough opposition too. I mean, he got it done. He stayed after it. He didn't get spun out. I'm super proud of my brother taking, taking on the responsibility of having every one of his youngsters with him. Plus his wife, I've been there, done that. I know that type of pressure that you're under because you want everybody to have a great time. You want the girls to be successful. You want the hunt to be successful, but more importantly, we get lost in that a lot of times. And we, we lose the, the fact that, man, we're passing on our tradition to, to our, to our kids, you know, and to, in letting our wife see what draws them to that. It, it's a bond that'll bond you and your children for the rest of your lives. And I mean, it's, it's special And yeah. to go through what you guys went through. Wasn't some of the easiest stuff to go through either. And uh, Luis, man, he just killed it. I'm, I'm so proud of you. It was awesome. Thank you, brothers. It was uh it was an incredible weekend. Definitely. It's down for the memories forever. Oh yeah, for um, sure. It, just watching the little ones just, you know, blossom into just being outdoorsy all of a sudden when I thought it wasn't there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> you thought you were going to be tiaras and tea parties the rest of your life. <laughs> man. And, uh, you know, the wife, just a trooper, um, yeah. just everything. And, and look, it, the, the way we did this trip, it was not conducive for like having. <laughs> nice facilities right yeah, yeah they, i wasn't staying were, at the holiday inn no we we didn't there's no water there's no electricity it was like complete camp out and um and it was cold and uh so it uh it, it really it really was unforgettable and and the youngest one just developing into you know, an amazing hunter that I didn't think, you know, she was wanting, you know, she was ever wanting to be, you know, and, sure. uh, and then the older one just kind of progressing into being able to shoot her rifle and just being more mature and understanding, you know, more of the hunting stuff. And then again, the, the wife being so supportive, um, look, it was, I couldn't ask for any better. Uh, we, yeah, we had some up and ups and downs yep. that's hunting. That's hunting. Um, we, especially when you do it with archery. Uh, but like, if you think of the weekend and, and think, man, eight animals were shot um, oh. and, and six were recovered. Yeah. That's, that's pretty amazing. And that's only in two days of hunting. So yeah. um, unbelievable. I can't, I'm so blessed and I am thankful. And, A lot of and, lessons and all of that, man. Oh man. Huge yeah. for yeah. sure. And, and I know about the pressure that you're talking about and I know about <laughs> deal with the children i know about them complaining about facilities i mean i've had to deal with you guys for the last few years yeah. <laughs> i knew it was coming <laughs> well, I yeah, when it. he starts all coming. serious like that i know no doubt i'll uh i'll give joey's due he's he's babysat us for many years he has my fat ass i promise you so <laughs> at the end of the day he's taking care of me for a long time so and and look i i there were, there were times that I had to kind of separate myself from, from the family. Cause I was like, so frustrated with these two animals I couldn't find. Right. And, uh, you know, between my brothers, Manano and, and, and Gilbert just, uh, you know, they had the right words to, to kind of you know, keep me at it and, uh, you know, uh, and, yep. uh, pull through, but yeah, the ups I, told, and downs. I told you, I told you when I seen your era from, your deer i'm like that deer's dead dude yeah you know yeah. he and he ain't far if he's no, 150 were, if he's 150 yards he's too far oh no, right? you were absolutely right he was 60 yards from where i shot yeah that tall, <laughs> that tall grass makes it tough man it's super hard man there yeah. that's that's why i tell a lot of people man if you can get a dog trained up they're their best bet your best friend when yeah, you're, that, that's when you're hunting. Awesome. yeah yeah Absolutely, man. So let's 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 welcome our razor back, man. We've got, we've got a guy that, uh, well, you know, we're gonna we got a woo pig suey. Yeah. Oh Good lord. Homes. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk to our razor back, man. What welcome, yeah. Stefan, to the group, man. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you having me on tonight. So tell Thanks. everybody about yourself, where you're from. Uh, my name is Stefan Richardson. Live in Springdale, Arkansas. I'm a husband of 21 and a half years oh got five beautiful kids uh five no tv five, five <laughs> grandkids yeah, yeah during so. covid <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. but uh yeah just been bow hunting you know all of my life and you know faith yeah, and family and then the outdoors 
I saw some photos of uh, of a buck you just took as well, man, and some great yeah. video. There are some photos there. Yeah, been, we've had a really good season this year. So uh, the rut's in full swing here in northwest Arkansas, and and a lot of deer. Same moving, here, so. I think. So what kind of land Same are you here. hunting the deer on? Was that public? You're a private land, or? I'm hunting on private land for my whitetails here. Um, the man that I work for owns a couple of different little pieces of property. Um, one of them's roughly about 200 acres. Another one's about 65 acres, just small places, you know, in the Ozarks, you know, mm -hmm. we're in the foothill of the Ozarks. So, brother, um, the place I'm, I was hunting this past weekend, I'm on a, a bench below the ridge top and, and the red oaaks are dropping and i mean there wow, were deer everywhere beautiful. it was really fantastic mm -hmm. you know the other south guy, there beaver lake right yeah 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 and i, I you live know close enough to the lake i can hear the boats when the leaves are off wow uh -huh. that's awesome i cool. you know that cool. country up there is, is is uh it's awesome it's beautiful too man uh, that area around the ozarks is is flat gorgeous um, my daughter goes to school in Arkansas, so we drive through there quite a bit okay. and, uh, they played, uh, in the GAC championship up there in Bentonville, which is just to the oh, north yeah. of you there. So, yeah. um, I, you know, what a beautiful place up there, Arkansas is. They got, man, they got bears in Arkansas, Joe, you know, yeah, yeah. our old buddy, our old buddy, Gene Shockey, he's got a place there in Arkansas and, you know, he, I think he's got a couple hundred acres too, Stefan. And I grew up on 188 acres all my life. And then my uncle had another 135 that backed up to us. So we hunted small parcels of land my whole life. And we kill 10 or 12, 12 deer off that place every year, you mm -hmm. know, uh, down here in Texas. So, yeah. um, I know what hunting small places is all about. And, and look, man, it can be really good too. Yeah, they can be. So you're a, you're a whitetail killer. But how yes. long have you been, and we're not going to give away any of the story until we tell it, but how many years, I mean, we kind of gave it away in the intro, but you've been hunting elk for how long? Well, it'll, uh, it'll take us back to 2005 was my first time going elk hunting. Oh, okay. And then I had a large gap and then I went again in 2019. So I had a 14 year layoff just because of you know, five kids raising a family. Right, right. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm surprised you're back work. at it. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I went in 2019 and then didn't go in 20 and I was able to go this year. So you awesome. basically, um, you were unsuccessful back in five. You were unsuccessful yep. in 19 and you've had a year to, and, and I know you've been prepping because, you know, we talked about this a little bit before we started recording, before the rest of the guys were here, but you, I don't know if the rest of the crew you guys remember, but we got, um, Stefan sent a letter to Chav back a year ago, man. Um, you know, cause you're a runner as well. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you were talking about running marathons and, and, uh, and, and how you were thinking about Chav during that marathon. Yeah, it was, it was, a. Uh... Chav was just a really big inspiration, you know, going through the struggles you guys uh, saw him go through the fall of 2020. And I was in the middle of training for a marathon and I knew Chav was a runner and, um, you know, COVID hit right there at the, at the beginning of the year and they canceled our, our in-person marathon there. So I, um, you know, I just, um, we had a choice where we could run it virtually at home or, or whatever, you know, so I was going to run the marathon and, and it was just pretty cool because I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get Chav out of my head, um, for the struggle that he was going to go through and face to try to get back on the mountain with his brothers. So, um, the morning, whenever I got out to the, the trail where I run, I just, um, I said a little prayer for Chav and I took off in a, at every mile that clicked off on my marathon, I would think of Chav and say a quick prayer for him and just thank the Lord for my health, for being able to be out there. And then um, on the back, you know, six miles to go is whenever a marathon, you know, I, I always say you run 17 to warm up and you really run three and then you survive the last six. Right. You know? yeah. <laughs> and um, so when I got in those last six miles, it was pretty challenging and, and every time that I would get in a dark spot and think about wanting to slow down or stop, I would just draw from Chab's strength of how much, you know, that he would 
give anything to be able to be out walking much less running like I was, you know? So it was, yeah. uh, it was, it was just a cool day that I felt like I took Chav on a run with me. Wow. Yeah, I guess you're not so bad after all, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he said, he sent me a letter and we corresponded and it, uh, it meant a lot, a lot to me. That's awesome. I appreciate that. You and you were talking about Gilbert, you were talking about bears and I'm going to switch over from this just a little bit before we start getting into the show. Cause I'm anxious to get Stefan on telling his story. Sure. Uh, but before we do, you were talking about the bears also up there in Arkansas. Remember we were talking about elk in Oklahoma, right? The other day. And we were, Definitely. so I got a message from Jacob Bailey out of Oklahoma. He sends me a, a message said that he was listening to our previous podcast when we were talking about the elk in Oklahoma. And, and according to him, he said that there are four or five free ranging elk herds in Oklahoma. He said that they have some scattered across the panhandle, some small herds on private land in the Northwest, West Central Oklahoma. And he said, that's where all the state uh, records are shot from. And they have large herds in the Southwest on the Wichita National Wildlife Refuge and private land that has draw hunts there. And they also have draw hunts on the, you know, all right. Pushmataha. Oh, there you go. Pushmataha. Pushmataha. The, hills, <laughs> the, Savannah, the Cherokee Wildlife Management Areas in the Southwest. So it sounds like Oklahoma is starting to get with the program. Huh. I didn't even know they had draw hunts yeah. in Oklahoma for elk. Yeah. That's, wow. That's, that's awesome, man. That's <clears throat> What about Arkansas, Stefan? You guys have any of that happening there? Yeah, we have a herd of elk um, that's really just a little over an hour east of us, over around the Buffalo River. Uh huh. And I've put in, you know, they give away a handful of tags each year, and I I keep putting in, haven't drawn yet, but you never know. So let me tell you something, man. There, there's um here in New Mexico, there's a big conversation going on about about tags and drawing. And we're going to actually, guys, we're going to hit a show on this because it's got me worked up a little bit and, and in ways that most people might not even think, man. But, you know, it's, um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that part. But, you sure. know, I, what I want people to realize is here in New Mexico, elk were extinct. I mean, they were gone. And it was in 1910. 1910, 1911, that the first group of elk, I think it was about 15 to 20 head, were brought into the Vermejo Park in 1910. And then another 15 head were brought into northern New Mexico by game and fish as well. Um, but it was those original elk that have that are populated the state? Yes, sir. Wow. That's yeah. That's cool. now, well, I mean, it's 100, 100 and some odd years ago. Now, there's been some other introductions as well, but those ones came from Yellowstone. Those original ones mm -hmm. came from mm -hmm. a Yellowstone. And yeah, as I'm that group heard. started to grow, and this is something that happens all the time, is that, you know, they'll go, and this happens for uh, antelope and different, and different animals in the state. They go in, they find in a healthy herd, and like even the bighorn sheep, they'll go ahead and take some of those off the private land and they'll move those into other areas and continue to plant those animals. But mm -hmm. shoot, I mean, when you take a look at, at, you know, starting with 15 and we're at what, 70,000, 80,000, you yeah. know, head strong here and moving more and more all the time. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing. So all these states, like when you take a look at Arkansas and you take a look at Oklahoma, Kentucky, Georgia, Pennsylvania. Look, there's a big herd in the Glass Mountains in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and Texas ain't wised up yet to sell tags. Yeah. So because it's all private land. Yep, absolutely, man. So it it's 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 growing. These critters are spreading more and more. And with you know, that's why people need to support things. You know, from like the Rocky Mountain Elk Federation, we got to find ways to, you know, to as well. There's got to be other outlets as well. To you know, we we talk about everybody's always talking about oh, the problems with more people hunting. We need more people hunting, mm -hmm. but as the pie starts to get smaller, we need to increase the size of the pie, man. You know, we need to find more country. And a lot of times, that means taking a look at some of these private parcels that are up for sale and finding ways of getting that land like what the Rocky Mountain Elk Federation, but we got to even get more happening like that. Yeah. Get those so that we get more and more access to land that's either landlocked or opens up new areas or gives people a chance to get in places, man. The more we do that, the better it's going to be for 
all of us as outdoorsmen and for those animals as well. So and that, there's my little soapbox for tonight, man. So. <laughs> now I'm with you, Joe. Uh, as much as we can do for our conservation and opening the areas up, that's yep. uh, definitely what we need to do. I mean, we've already been in the highest population uh, of elk hunters uh, that there was. So, I mean, we, we know – I mean, there, there, uh, there are obstacles to that. And there are also really good things about that as, as well. So absolutely, um, man. So why don't you get us well, right, bro? You bet you guys, you know what time it is. Uh, it's time for the Elk Bro shout outs. If you're new to our show, this is shout out to a few cities with the most listeners topping our charts this week, Joe. Yeah. And what I'm going to do, man, we haven't done this in a while. And I just looked at this guys, man. And you know, we have the top all time list and I'm kind of excited how some of this is, is going and changing again, man, we're getting ready to bump 9,000 listening cities, <laughs> which is so exciting. 9, wow. Thank you to our listeners. Please. And, thank you. Yeah, man. And, uh, I, I want to give you that top all time list, man. And, and this is top 10 in 10th place right now, Atlanta, Georgia. So we had Atlanta, Georgia house in the top 10, man. Wow. Uh, in ninth, uh, South Salt Lake, Utah. In fact, Utah is in the top 10 twice and up here as well. So Ooh. is it, and, and I bet you could probably guess, guess what other state is probably here twice, but let, let's, uh, let's see <laughs> yeah. how it goes now in the seventh spot and coming out of nowhere. And they weren't even in the top 10 here in a long time. And they are right on seventh place. They're getting ready to bump that. Uh, this is 10, nine, eighth place right now, getting ready to get into that seventh place spot is our five Oh five man, Albuquerque, New Mexico. So that's, that's we're, Very I'm cool. Excited. Yeah, that's way cool, man. The hometown folks are listening in the seventh spot with Albuquerque on the rear end, soft, Salt Lake City, Utah. In the sixth position is Portland, Oregon. And then taking that fifth and the fourth, first we have Seattle, Washington in the fifth yeah. position, Lake Stevens, Washington wow. in the fourth position. And this is something that has always surprised me, and it just really excites me that uh, our third place position is Chicago, Illinois. I just wow, Joe. The Windy City shows up in the top three. Yeah, and wow, they've actually been up there in that top five, man, uh, for sure. a while. They've been actually battling back and forth with Lake Stevens there, and you know, in the top two positions, man, <laughs> we've got one from Colorado, one from Texas. We got both of them are big D's, man. And, and listen, it is a neck to neck battle right now for that top position. And currently the runner up in there is Denver, Colorado, right? Yeah, buddy. <laughs> so Ooh. top, still the top listening city of all time right now is Dallas, Texas right now. So. Out of way, big D. Yeah. Lone zero, zero listens out. from Manano on that one. Cause we know we don't <laughs> listen to podcasts. Yeah. I don't need to listen because I'm in the podcast. Also. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh and joe we got some countries down there too listed yes sir let's go international man yeah man this this was pretty cool too um in the top 10 positions uh in 10th position we have the united arab emirates <laughs> uae wow united um ninth position japan wow eighth position afghanistan Man, that's got to be from some of our armed forces over there. Absolutely. I, I believe mm -hmm. so, man. Thank you guys uh, for your service. Absolutely. In seventh position, we have the Virgin Islands. In fifth position, Germany. Sweet. Fifth position, Mexico. Rodale. Oh, actually, let's see. I think I'm uh, – so actually, that was fifth was Mexico. Fifth position, fourth position was France. In third position is the United Kingdom. Okay. And second position is Australia. And thank you from the, down under. The top international listening country right now, still with a big lead out there, is our brothers and sisters in the north in Canada. Man, that way to go, cool. eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and yeah, we get man. a lot of letters and a lot of support from those folks up north man yeah for sure 
man, they got some good elk hunting in Saskatchewan, all that area up through there, Joe. Um, Alberta. You know, up around Calgary, Alberta. Yes, all of that. It's uh, supposed to be solid. Yeah. Moose and elk and you name it. We're going to find out one of these days. I'm going to yeah. tell you. Absolutely, man. We get a lot of invitations from those folks up there. Now, before we start our shout outs, though, man, we have since Stefan, since you're the guest, man, and I know you've listened to a lot of the shout outs. So here's your chance, man. Let's let's get you to give a little shout out. All right. Originally inhabited by Osage Indians, this area was hunted seasonally. It was first settled in the 1830s and the area was known as Shiloh. In 1872, the first post office was established, and there was already a Shiloh, Arkansas, so the name was changed to Springdale, Arkansas. Springdale is home to poultry giant Tyson Foods and George's Poultry, and was at one time home for Cargill, and we were at one time the poultry capital of the United States. That's Um, awesome, man. Hey, Tyson. Yeah, give him that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, man, you were Shiloh. It was Shiloh before, huh? Before yeah. Springdale. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's hmm. awesome, man. Springdale. Like Shiloh. What do you do? What do you do for a living, Stefan? Uh, I am the director of transportation for a refrigerated trucking company. Okay. Awesome. Y'all, awesome. y'all haul a bunch of them chickens. Absolutely. I figured that. <laughs> there you go. Yes, sir. <laughs> Chav, you're up, man. Okay. Uh, this city is located south of the North Canadian River at the intersection of state highways 51 and 58. It derived its name from Cantonment, a nearby military post that was established in 1878. The United States Army Corps of Engineers created a lake here in 1848 to control flooding, the Chamber of Commerce inaugurated the Walleye Rodeo, a fishing derby establishing the lake's claim as the walleye capital of Oklahoma. And this is in Canton, Oklahoma. Canton, Oklahoma. Canton, Oklahoma. Yeah. In the house, man. What was that? <laughs> Did we have one of our native mules cat joining? yawning or something like that? <laughs> that was a cow call. Yeah. I don't know about that. that. Was a meow call. <laughs> a meow call. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> you, nothing, man. you know, I had uh, to look that word up, uh, cantonment, because uh-huh. I wonder what that was there. But And what I learned was is that you have military bases where strictly only military live on that. And right. yet, where it's a mix of regular citizens and military first military yep yeah pretty cool okay. next up this was the first community in california to have a name that was not a spanish or native american origin home to california's oldest university the university of the pacific the average temperature is 75.5 degrees and it has over 1000 waterways wow. which makes a boaters and fisherman paradise. It is, cert- it is centrally located and has a diverse international population. No matter the cuisine, you'll find it here. Annual events include a Cinco de Mayo festival and Cambodian New Year celebration and a Greek food festival. This is going to Stockton, California. Stockton, California in the house. Cali. Yes, sir. <laughs> Cali shows up, home of one of the baddest men on the planet and my favorite MMA fighter, none other than Nate Diaz. Really? For sure, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Stockton, baby. Him and his brother Nick uh, come out of Stockton, California, and two of the baddest men on the planet to ever walk into the octagon. Oh, Gilbert, you got to say that name like you mean it, though, man. Let's get, I mean, let, let's hear that announcement. Nate Diaz. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. and sometimes using the word yearly it's you know helps it doesn't you know get things confused yearly <laughs> events annual. yearly annual i like annuals <laughs> <laughs> these guys are too much man well, up next joe this city is a suburban bedroom community for seattle it was named after the wife of the local realtor it was first inhabited by the Snohomish 
tribe of Native Americans that used the area for summertime activities, including hunting, fishing, and berry gathering, and root cultivation. The Treaty of the Point of Elliot in 1855 opened the area for settlement. This city is the major job center for the Snohomish, for Snohomish County, but only 7% of the workers live within the city limits. In none other than Linwood, Washington. Linwood, Washington. You know, Gilbert, you said last week, where was Washington? Yeah, man, right there. Here they are. They're right back, man. Right back in the right back in the scuffle the house. Yeah. Those those boys heard that. They were out hunting and they said, Man, we're gonna <laughs> we gotta get Yeah, up. we're gonna show up. <laughs> we're gonna show, show up for sure. Yep. Yeah, we're I, too bad. We're going to have to skip the next one because cold ain't here. Joe, what's the next list in the city, man? <laughs> yeah, so I, I think, Luis, I think, you know. <laughs> that, that means, uh, <laughs> All right, so this city was named uh, from a modified French term, meaning bitter water and or with a gravel bank. An actual ghost town named Welch Point is located within the town. It gets its name from a local and popular fishing lake and from the award-winning cheeses produced 10 miles south of the town in Durand, Wisconsin. Uh, the cheeses, Parmesan, Asiago, and Romano are U.S. national cheese champions and are, and are renowned worldwide. <clears throat> Let me see if this one comes out right, man. And none other than Ogol. Wisconsin. Oh God! I, I, Wisconsin. I'm not even attempting, man. I, I it, it, oh God. Does has anybody heard this city before? Yeah, I've heard of it, but I ain't never been there, Joe. Is that how shocking? It yeah, I believe it is. Oh God! Uh, oh guy! Oh guy! Oh God! Oh, God. oh wow, man! I, that's oh. awesome. Yeah, and you know, you figure if it's Wisconsin, it's got to have cheese happening, right? That's right. No, he has <laughs> plenty of it. Cheese champions, man. And and you know what, man? We had Cole's name in for that because I mean, it, we, we didn't know. Yeah, who, sure. You know, Whatever. You know Whatever. what? Whatever. I mean? <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Another reason why I shouldn't have attended tonight's show. <laughs> you might have needed a manicure. You know, I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> last but not least this city was named by a railroad station master's daughter who was setting the first catholic king of the franks the city is home to a prehistoric native american culture in 2006 one of the largest cheese producing plants the southwest cheese company was completed here it is the largest cheddar cheese producer in north america this top listening city is also home to the Cannon Air Force Base and its stealth fighter jets. In its early days, the local Norman Petty music studio was the actual studio where Buddy Holly recorded. And, you know, you hear all this cheese stuff. You, everybody's like, well, are we back to Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. No, y'all, man, this is Clovis, New Mexico in the house. Clovis, New Mexico. Yep. That's awesome. Drive through there all the time when I'm coming to elk hunting. Great, great city here in New Mexico. I've stopped through there all the time on my way elk hunting to the great state of New Mexico or Colorado. And uh, usually I, I stop in there and get some fuel and fuel up in Clovis. And I know I'm not too dang far from, from where Joe lives to lay my head down, go to the, uh, the Ornella suite there at Joe's house. So <laughs> it's awesome. And before we get to Stefan's story, um, I, I want to just give him a little shout out too, because when he sent a letter with his story and uh, put the, all the information, got that to us, he also added something down on the bottom. You know, I don't know if you remember, but you said that, man, we ought to, we ought to create some kind of t-shirt or something like that. What was that? Yeah. yeah the 10% club. I, <laughs> that, you know, that's what everybody talks about. Only 10% of elk hunters get to come out heavy so you and i think that's a, a big number 10 club yeah i think that's a big number too oh there check that go, out bud. so that is awesome uh and, oh, dude i like how that one has that little yeah, cut out of the, the tag man yeah 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 i like it too yeah so it's it, awesome 
and you know, Stefan gave us that idea, man. This came from our listeners. Guys, what you're seeing here, this is our t-shirt. It is now in production. It'll be out here in a couple of weeks, ready for sale. Um, proud, man, wear it loud and proud. It's a way to celebrate, you know, being part of that 10% club. <laughs> uh, so believing and achieving. So if definitely you, like that, Joe. Yeah, for our listeners that aren't that aren't looking at this, if you go on YouTube, we actually have a we have a sample shirt up right now showing, and it it says ten percent club, and on the ten percent, it it shows kind of the dates that you would notch out there, and it has a notch notch out. So it's uh we're pretty excited about that, and that's that's all because of you, Stefan. That looks fantastic, Joe. Yeah, it looks really cool. That's great really idea. Cool. Can't wait to be wearing mine around. Absolutely. You have to, you have to give me the link so I can pre-order. Every order number one. Now we're sending you a free one. Joe's gonna have to come up off that money. Stephen, don't, don't let him make you buy a jack. All right, let's let's get going into our content, man. Stefan, um, it, this is what we want to do is we want you to go ahead and tell your story, and um, you can start it. I mean, let let's start it from you know 2019 after you get done with that and and what it takes and the thought process and we're just going to kind of let you tell the story and every now and then we might kind of ask for a little clarification but then we're going to kind of as we do that we really want people to hear about the ups the downs your decisions and some of the unexpected things because you had some really really cool things happen yeah along this yeah, journey and so it was um you know, going back to 2019, that's when I first really started listening to podcasts. And um, you guys were one of the first ones that I had discovered. And so if you don't you know, mind me asking, all, Stefan, how did you discover us on the podcast? I just uh, searched elk hunting. Got you. You know, just went into Apple podcast and and just was it, was it like the first choice or did, the, did it come up with a list and you just kind of win by like it's two looks years name and or? too many moons ago yeah. i can tell you makes sense <laughs> it's been a long time. you know i just i saw the name and i thought you know well we got to check this out so cool. um i downloaded a bunch of episodes and you know i listened through them all the way through preparation for 2019 but um when we listened to them on the way out there um that year i went with a you know, my hunting partner and we went to a unit that was an over the counter unit that a friend had told me about and, um, and got into elk, you know, we had elk bugle on the first day and over the course of our trip ended up calling in two different bulls. Um, just not shots that I would take. The first one was, you know, 25 to 30 yards frontal right at the break of a hill. Didn't have a clear, you know, shot. So I passed that. And then the second one, he got to 55 yards, which I'm more than confident to shoot. Um, but I was actually caller. My bow was on my pack. Um, my partner, Jason, was set up in the direction where the bull had originally started. And he ended up kind of circling, coming around. I got my bow off the pack and um, where he stopped breaking on the other side of the, the draw from us. You know, I had a clean shot other than all of the brush on my side. So I just, I couldn't get to the open uh, before he, you know, left the area and eased out. But um, I left that hunt, you know, not satisfied. How many days ahead. did you hunt on that hunt? We were there for, um, we were there for eight days. We okay. had 10 days off. So two days of travel, one out, one yeah. back. Um, and you know, we got to uh, learn a lot about the area that we were in. Um, but over the course of the hunt, that terrain was not typical what you're going to see elk terrain. Uh, so far as when people imagine going to Colorado, it was <laughs> it was not high alpine, you know, type stuff. There was black timber, but it was more Mesa country, um, a lot of open sage country. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we were there during the muzzleload season also. So that had a lot of increased pressure. The elk yeah. weren't really responding that well. Um, so I left that hunt knowing that the next time I went, I wanted to do things the way I wanted to do it. Um, and that was 
you know, I've always dreamed of hunting in the backcountry with my camp on my back. Um, when I went the first time, I hunted that type of country, but it was my first time ever elk hunting, first time in Colorado. And the guys I went with, nobody would, you know, get off the, you know, Beaten more trail. than a quarter mile, half mile off the trail, you know. Yeah, um, that fear I, factor, right? Yeah. yeah. And I had, you know, on that trip in 2005, I had my topo maps. I'd already ma done my scouting off my maps. And I called in two bulls the first day, one to uh, come in to 72 broadside, come across the park. And then he didn't come across the park. He came to the park. That's a lesson I learned from yeah. you guys. Yeah. Uh, he went back in the timber. Well, I realized I needed to get to the timber to call him. So as I start moving, they start bugling again. Here comes a bull. And don't get a shot. Too much oak brush. You know the story. Yeah. Um, so I left that hunt kind of with that longing. So, um, and it was 14 years after that longing, yeah, right? It was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so leading up to this year, um, last fall, we, neither one of us could go last year. Um, as winter came on, I had it in my mind that I, you know, that I wanted to go in 2021 and, um, you know, I talked to my hunting partner about it. Um, he was getting married this this past summer, so it wasn't going to work for him. I talked to a couple other guys that couldn't go, and and I just decided, you know what? If I wait till it's convenient, it's never going to be the right time to go. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to load up the truck and drive to Colorado alone, and I'm going to go hunt. And um, once I decided that I was going to do that, I really got all in on it. Um, so, you know, physical preparation, um, that started, but I knew that I had to really get mentally ready, um, to go hunt alone. And why? And why? Just because like you say, the fear factor, the unknown, um, you know, I've, I've never had a problem hunting alone. I hunt alone most of the time here, but you know, that's not the same as, um, being in the mountains, you know, no doubt. How so, uh, you planning? yeah, you're real close to civilization. Yeah. It, yeah there right. where you hunt locally. So the first step to, to put my wife's mind at ease and mine as well is I took a lead from, uh, Luis, I believe was the one that started with the Zolio. Yeah. yeah. Buddy. And so I, I purchased one of those so that, you know, no matter what I knew I would have communication and I just, um, you know, I learned about the, the different types of packs that I wanted to get the food um, and just, you know, started building my, my gear cache that I was going to need. And so those worries are out of the way. Um, my only real focus was wanting to give myself every opportunity I could to be successful when I went out there. Um, you know, I've always wanted to hunt this way. Now I'm going to hunt this way. So, you know, I don't want to go hiking for eight or 10 days in the woods. I want to go elk hunting and I want to, I want to come out heavy. And so, you know, that's, I listen to you guys every week, no matter what, you know, it just automatically downloads. I, I've got about a 45, 50 minute drive to work every day. So whenever you guys download, I'm always listening to you on the way to work. And so that was getting me an amount of knowledge. Um, my wife is actually a teacher. And so Joe, whenever you and Chav talk about having been teachers and you explain the elk Academy, teaching it from a teacher background, you know, I felt like it would be something that I would be able to really gain knowledge from. So, so I went ahead and signed up and um, just really consumed that with, um, diligence, you know, tried to pay attention to every module. Um, and one thing I think you guys have spoke on before is not skipping over stuff, you know, just because you think, you know, something don't skip it. And I found that to be pretty valuable. Um, you know, we've all learned lessons in life and work, whatever, that if you think, you know, something, you better learn it again, just to make sure that you know what you know. So, mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of what I did getting ready to go to Colorado this year. 
Did you use any type of uh, base yeah. map or Onyx or yeah, that's, Google Earth or <clears throat> Fat that's Map? One, this one thing that I did was, um, you know, in the past I've gone to places that other people knew, mm -hmm. and this time I wanted to be able to pick my own spot, and so that you know, whenever you hunt with a group or you go with someone else, your sex, your success may or may not rest on them. So. This time, I really wanted to go to a place where everything's on me. You know, my success, my failure, it's going to be on my back. So um, I subscribed to uh, Go Hunts Insider. Mm -hmm. And I just took and filtered down the things that I was looking for in Colorado and found a unit. Well, I actually found two units that were not too far apart. So um, I was going to focus on those two. And we're talking OTC, right? OTC, yes. Yeah. And um, I had some criteria that I wanted in in my mind for where I hunted to have. And these units were not terribly far from the place that I hunted in 19. So I knew I, I, knew I had past experience there where I could at least take that knowledge and try to get on elk. So um, I narrowed my search down. Once I did that, I... What were the features, Stefan, that you were looking for? What well, were those things? Um, I wanted to find areas that were, um, that had a decent uh, bull to cow ratio. Mm -hmm. And and what was um, decent to you? What, what, what kind of... I think I put in like 28 or 30 to 100. Okay. I think somewhere in that range was mm -hmm. the criteria I used. Right. Um and I wanted to find some wilderness area if I could so that I could get away from roads because, you know, I wanted to try to, you know, get a backcountry experience. And um, so I put those in and I don't think I adjusted harvest percent because it doesn't matter to me what, you know, what happened last year is just in a history book. You know, right. it all matters what happens this year. So, um yeah. So, you know, I narrowed those areas down. I found um, my primary unit that I wanted to hunt. Um, so I looked for, um, I was using Onyx and uh, Google Earth. And what I did was I looked for a place where I could park um, that was near a trailhead that once I left the trailhead, <laughs> whether on the trail or not, that there were going to be no roads within, you know, however far. I mean, like the places that I was in, I could have walked for miles and miles without ever hitting a road. So that was, that was what I wanted to do is not only the roads, do, but. Did that also include other <clears throat> forest trails itself or was it just strictly roads? That's part of what I was going to say is, uh -huh. um, and I didn't really want to be, close to a lot of trails because right. like I said, I'm a runner. Um, and I know a lot of people that run mountain trails and you know, that I, I just wanted to try to eliminate any of that, that I could. Um, so I, I picked my spot. Um, and it comes to time. I load the truck. I left home at six o'clock on a Tuesday morning of opening week. Um, so I drove from home to, uh, I drove about 980 miles that first day, got a room. So, um, I wanted to get, you know, well into Colorado so that I would spend the night, um, at, at elevation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, I got my room the next morning, which is the day before opener, um, I got my tags, um, and so this is September first. Correct, September first, yeah. mm -hmm. and um, I loaded my coolers with ice right then because I had every intention of needing that ice. So love um, it, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I the drove, right mindset right there. Heck yeah. So I drove to. Uh, oh, let me back up. You're gonna love this. So. On the Tuesday, whenever I'm in Texas, headed west, I stop at a at a Love's truck stop that had a, 
a subway in there. So I have to, you know, I'm going to grab some lunch and I get a sandwich, a tea and a bag of chips. And she said, that'll be $7 and 77 cents. I said, I'll take that receipt. Seven, seven, seven. Yeah. So I kept that receipt in the truck. But, uh, nice. Oh, you're not so super anyway, I, I guess then, huh? I no, I, I'm a bow hunter, you know. I'm not, not any talking, super. We're not yeah. talking to a baseball yeah, yeah. I don't wear the same hat, yeah. the same underwear, none of that. But, mm-hmm. uh, so anyway, I get, to, I get to where my parking spot is at the trailhead. And my original plan was to bail off the mountain away from the trailhead, cross a creek, climb the opposite mountain because it was the farthest away from from any real trails. And it was where the wilderness really comes up and meets private land. So I felt like, you know, I for my scouting, I found some some really good benches back in there on some North Face and a couple of saddles. Um, so I felt like that was going to be a dandy spot. Um, How far off the trailhead were you that you felt uh, like your hunting would start? It was going to be, you know, realistically, by the time you cross the creek and get up the other side, it was going to be a, at least a mile okay. off the road. Okay. Um, so I don't and know what if kind you of guys elevation rem- are you talking there, Stefan? I'm parked at 8,000. Okay. And um, so I was going to be hunting up to, you know, between 10, 5 and 11. Um, and that was, again, intentional so that the majority of my pack was going to be downhill um, because there were some places I could have accessed from above. But um, just the way I wanted to go, I chose to start from down there. Do the work um, on the front end. Right. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yep. So you're fresher then too. Yeah. yeah. So I get uh, I get out of the truck, shoot my bow, everything's good, and I um, I load my pack up, and as I get done loading the pack up, it starts raining. You know, just a pretty heavy drizzle, really. It's not pouring. So I got my pack fly out. I got my rain jacket on, and um, I had intended to take my other jacket in my pack with me, but I took it out. So I just have my rain jacket on. It's, you know, it's not going to be super cold. Um, I think where I was at the highs was, you know, in the mid to upper fifties and low is going to be in the upper thirties. Um, so I head off the mountain, find a little bit of sign going down. Well, by the time I get to the bottom, it's raining pretty good. Um, but like I say, I've got rain, rain jacket on, no problem. Uh, take the boots and socks off, wade the creek. Um, you know, that was pretty cool. It was it was knee deep and rushing, you know, and you've got your pack on and your bow. And uh, so I did have a trekking pole out to make sure I didn't bust it. And um, got across the creek, lots of bear tracks in the bottom. That was really cool. Um, <laughs> it was really Devin, cool. Devin, just curiosity, how much did your pack weigh? Uh, weighed it before I left home. I had, um, <clears throat> loaded with three liters of water and four days and nights worth of food. I was packing 37 pounds. So I had it bad. Oh, wow. Not bad at yeah. all. Bad. No, no. Yeah, cause no, I think, Lucius, I think my pack Lucius weighs that every for day. One, one yeah. afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah I, I think Luis is just his, just a small part of his pack weighs 30 something. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just hearing hey, uh, a guy. I'm just hearing a guy as anal as me weighing a pack and taking all the precautions. Yeah, that's, uh, that's all yeah. I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah, you know. His are you, quiver are, weighs it, 37 pounds. Yeah. Stepping uh, what size are you? How, how, how I, tall? How tall are you? I'm about 5'11". Okay. I weigh okay. right at about 180. Uh, I knew I hated him. <laughs> <laughs> I got a leg that weighs that much, Stephen. Yeah. Hey, Stephen. So, uh, did you did you did you choose that particular uh, area because of water source or or because of well, the wilderness? Um, yeah, it was the wilderness, and you know, looking at the maps, I knew I would be able to find water on the mountain, so you know that really wasn't a concern. Um, and you know, which it was going to be nice to be able to to clean up if I needed to in the river, but it was a you know, it was a pretty good ways below 
the road. So I had to drop off a pretty good bit and then climb back up. But um, when I got across the creek, um, got my, you know, socks back on, my shoes, my boots, and up the, the other side I go, and I realized that, you know, everything is soaking wet, and I got about two benches up, and it was really, really thick, and I, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, I'm, I'm already sweating, and by the time I get yeah. to the top of the mountain, you know, I'm going to be soaked. My rain jacket's going to be soaked. All my gear's going to be soaked. I don't have extra pants. Um, I did have an extra shirt in my pack, but... You know, I was just yeah. thinking there's That's no need. Idea. In, yeah, the night before season opens, there's no need in getting up here and getting in a bind or getting cold. So um, I just decided to backtrack to the truck and just pitch my camp at the truck that, you know, my little tent there that night and that I would hunt the opposite direction open in the morning. You know, with the brush so thick, you know, everything's on you. So – you know, I just didn't want to spend, you know, four or five days up there, you know, soaking wet. Well, so yeah, good decision, man. I mean, you for, for real. Yeah, you mm-hmm. you think about that. I mean, things can go south real quick. You know, you can. That's why it's so important to have great rain gear, man. Yeah, I mean, if if the night does get cold, everything's wet. You're trying to get warmed up, and mm-hmm. you become miserable. You talk about the mental aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, yeah. the mental aspect can be tough when everything's going good for you. No doubt, yeah. you get it when it's going tough like that. So that's that was a that was a pretty experienced decision there. You know, really. I mean, a, a, there's a lot of people that would they're just gung ho that first thing. Like, oh, I'll just tough it through, man. But you know, that was that was real smart decision there. Yeah, thank. You. So, um, you know how the anticipation is the night before season. I. Uh, I think I dozed off a couple of times, but I won't say there was much rest and uh, the alarm <laughs> come early the next morning. Yeah. Um, and there There's was a lot going through your head, man. Yeah, it is. Yeah. There was uh, one other truck there the night that I, you know, the day that I got there, the day before season was a couple of guys pulled up right as I was getting ready. They were from, uh, from Nevada that had driven over to Colorado to hunt visited with them a little bit. They were going an opposite way than I was. So, um, on my map, um, I had pinned some areas that were East of me, um, and up the trail, you know, a couple of miles. Um, there were some good benches and some areas where I expected to find water, um, so will you explain to people how you knew there were some good benches? Well, looking at the, um, whenever I'm looking at on X, you know, I lay the topo lines over it mm-hmm. and, you know, like when you're looking at a North face and, you know, you've got the timber there anywhere, there's a slope going down and then those topo lines widen out. It's flat. I know that there's a bench right there somewhere. Mm-hmm. There you go. And, you can see a point, you can see those benches, and then you see anytime you see that hourglass, you know you've got a saddle area right yeah. there where, mm. um, you know, from deer hunting, mm. I know that animals travel here, saddles. that they use those saddles, and I know that Absolutely. You, know, heard you guys talk about mm-hmm. it also. Mm-hmm. Um, so that those areas were northeast of, of where I was parked, and then just due east of me, I had uh, one of those knuckle areas you talk about where several ridges kind of run up together. Yeah. And, um, boy, you've done some listening. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think you're more team Luis than you know that you think you are. (laughs) (laughs) The same. Yeah. So, um, so I start up the trail and, you know, I'm just really going slow and methodical, really trying to, to see what's in the timber. I'm trying to look for sign um, on the ground. I'm looking for, you know, rubs, Mm -hmm. Um, just easing along, cow calling, listening. Um, And that's, that's one other thing about hunting, you know, public land is that, you know, I'm, I'm not a quarter mile off the road and there are cattle pies everywhere. 
Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I understand that the elk live there, the cattle live there. I was glad it wasn't sheep. I've heard there can be problems for where cat, where elk are. I don't know. I haven't hunted around them, but yeah, they don't leave um, much feed, man, the sheep. Yeah. That's what, yeah. So I just, I knew what I had to deal with. It wasn't a discouragement, but I just like, well, where are the cows at? So that, you know, I can try to avoid, you know, where they're actively feeding at. Um, but as I'm headed east up the trail, you know, from the time I left the trail, you know, I'm climbing the whole day. Um, and I get back in there a ways and I'm, I'm still on the trail. I had been hunting, uh, you know, calling every few hundred yards and I would walk out ridges. Is this a forest trail or is this a game trail? Yeah, a forest trail. Okay. So I'm just slipping up the trail, you know, trying to gather information about the land, you know, okay. confirm what I've seen on my map. And it's about, it's probably about nine o'clock in the morning and I'm just slipping along and I hear a dog start growling and I'm like, what in the heck is going on? You know? And I turn around and here comes this guy walking up the trail. He's got his little lab dog. And I'm like, what in the world is going on here? You know, <laughs> this guy's out for a Sunday hike or something. And he comes up and we start visiting. And it was a, a 50 year old man that has just started hunting in the last few years. And he was just out on a hike with his dog. He had his 22 rifle slung across his back and he was grouse hunting. And with a 22? Yeah, 22 wow. rifle. I'll be darn. So he says his dog flushes them and, you know, the grouse just fly up in a tree and he pops them out with his 22. Man. So yeah, uh, around that cat if he misses. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> yeah, we won't go there, man. <laughs> yeah. Up in the tree with a 22. Okay. Yeah. Mile later. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, we visit a little bit and, um, you know, he tells me that that he rifle elk hunts in there. And I asked if he had had any success yet. And he said, no. And, and, um, he tells me about being one of these, uh, Alpine backcountry skiers, you know, that you see the crazy people that go off those bluffs. He's one of those people. And so, <laughs> you know, he's all over the mountains all the time and, and he's out hiking. And he told me where he had seen some elk, um, two weeks prior. And he said, if you want to go up there, this is where they're at. Um, so I just thought that was really cool. You Absolutely. know, another guy in the woods just sharing, uh, being cool. You know, like you guys say all the time, you you shake a man's hand and you have a friend for life or you yep. go down there and act like a butthead and, you know, you're not going to get nothing positive out of mm. it. So, uh, you know, we wished each other well. He asked if he could, you know, roll on past me. And I said, sure. So he – um he heads on up the trail and, and I hit off a, a ridge that I had in mind that I was going to hunt there. Uh, you know, found some, some sign that was a little old. It was, it was by no means, you know, fresh, uh, but at least I knew elk had been in the area. And, um, so I make my way back down, you know, after hunting that ridge out, I come back down to where the trail was because I was going to continue east. And, uh, I run into the man again and he was on the way out and, um, uh, and he said, Hey, uh, let me know if you kill one. I said, all right. He said, how are you going to get it out? I said, well, I was thinking about, you know, um, texting the outfitters, you know, to, I brought me know, a loaf for, of bread. I'm going to eat him up. I eat it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he said, yeah, I've got their number. He said, okay. I'll give it to you. So. You know, if I kill one, I'll have them help me pack it out. Or I said, if not, I'll just pack it out one, you know, one quarter at a time. Either way, I'm yeah. in good shape. So, you know, we'll um, we'll just get after it. But uh, we wish each other well again. He he heads on down the mountain, and I continue my hunt. And I got up to about 9,800 feet, and I hunted a ridge out, found some fresher sign, um, and actually, you know, walked up on a pretty little mule deer, um, and just, I was in a, a good area and it was close to that knuckle area I'm telling you about. So I felt like, um, you know, it's, it's middle of the day, probably around one thirty ish. 
And so I decided, well, this might be a good spot that I could just throw my spike camp out at right here um, because there was some some ground to the east of me that I wanted to hunt, you know, through the middle of the day. And then that afternoon, just north of me and up about 10,000, five or 600, there were some uh, parks that were at the bottom of some real steep high country. So I felt like if I didn't find what I wanted, you know, in that 98 to 10,000 foot, I was going to climb up there for the evening hunt. So I put my tent out um, and it started raining again. So I thought, shoot, (laughs) man, what better time to take a nap than in the rain in the middle of the woods, you know? So I took a nap, uh, woke up about 2, 2 2.30 and it was just stopping raining. So I, I loaded up and, and headed out. Um, I went probably another mile deep from where I was. Um, and as I was going along, whenever I would see these ridges from those, uh, that come up to the main ridge, I would, you know, I would hunt those out, you know, looking for sign. I hadn't heard any elk all morning or early afternoon. So now, when you say you would hunt those ridges out, yeah. You were hunting those ridges from the top of those ridges, working those, right? Yeah, I was just walking the ridge tops, um, just ease along. I would cow call a little bit, and about every other time I call, I would throw out a locate bugle, and I was really scout hunting as much as anything. You know, I'm just trying to Mm -hmm. figure out what the animals are doing. So, um you know, I would just work those ridges out and like I say, probably scouting as much as anything. Mm -hmm. Um, but I come back to the main trail headed East and, um, and got back in there, found a burn that I had seen on my map, checked it out. Um, I didn't cross the, the Canyon to it, but I knew how to get there. You know, I'm just really, like I said, boots on the ground, learning the place. Absolutely. (laughs) And, so I head back, I head back to where I was going to go to those parks. And it's probably by this time around four thirty, five 5 o'clock and it starts raining again. So, uh, my big rain jacket was back at the truck cause it had gotten wet that day before. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just sat out under a spruce tree that was dry underneath it and waited for it to quit raining and it quits raining <clears throat> I'm going to say around 5.30, quarter to 6. And so by this time, I knew I wasn't going to have time to climb up there and get to those get parts. To the higher area. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what I had decided to do was um, I'm where I'm at currently was in some black timber, um, and there was an aspen uh draw that really came up that where I had walked around the mouth of this uh, draw and it leads this draw runs way up the mountains and it was just full of aspens a lot of grass and I had found a little bit of sign in there so I just went back over there and was just looking and where I'm where I set up at was I'm about 40 yards I'm kind of on the ridge top of of where I'm at and I'm about 40 yards from the lip of where this draw drops off and goes down the mountain, you know, all the way to the bottom of the, where the Creek is three or four miles down there. And then it runs all the way up to the top, you know, basically where, um, to the East of where those, so I want to kind of describe this area that you're talking about, because what I, I've actually, I'm seeing it in my head and it's almost what we call like a drainage bench. So, you okay. and, and, and I'm always telling people, you know, I, when you look at land and you can see what, and what land looks elky, it's like, 
when Gilbert goes to a lake, he can tell what section looks fishy, man, where fish are going to be. And you can look in those areas where you have drainages that come and they, if it's multiple drainages, two of them come in with ridges and they end up hitting something that's almost like a delta is the only way you could describe it, mm -hmm. but it, it flattens out a little bit so that whatever drains off those hills end up, you know, kind of in that area, making that moister, getting a little bit you know, more grass yeah. in there. And the area that you're talking about is almost like, it's a lot like that, but it's a little different in that, you know, it, it is a draw, but it kind of comes and it'll, it'll drop, it'll flatten out and then it'll drop off hard. So it mm -hmm. creates this beautiful, dark, little grassy. I mean, there's good vegetation in there, but it's, it's, it's almost yeah. like a bench in a sense. Right. Yeah. 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 That's exactly what it was, Joe. Um, those are so, hot spots, man. It, it described what we hunted this year. <laughs> yeah. So what I did was um, I sat right up on the edge of the the black timber to where it was really transitioning to the aspens. Mm -hmm. And the reason I chose that um, just goes back to the Elk Academy. Um, in the Academy, you, you'd hammered home the stop and scan. So, um, the location I chose, the elk could come down the drainage and then come up to my bench that I'm on, or they could come up the drainage from the bottom and come up to the bench I'm on. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and I'm 40 yards from the lip of it. And, you know, like I say, it's now pushing so six you're 40 yards from where when you say lip from where it drops off on from down, where right? it drops off correct and why so, did you pick 40 yards Steve? well because it was right at the transition of the black timber mm -hmm. to the aspens and i knew i could shoot that with no problem so i knew that if he came up right there that he was going to be within range whenever he come into view so now you say he but you haven't heard or seen or smelled or anything yet right yeah, but I mean, I'm calling, so he's coming. Okay. So that's my that's my whole thinking is every time I set up, I'm calling. Um, it's just like turkey hunting here in Arkansas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, wherever I go turkey hunting. Every time you set up, and it's like Gilbert fishing, you throw that lure, you expect something to bite. There you go. Um, so whenever I'm calling, I'm expecting a response. So um, I set up. Yeah, even Where a silent, at, come, the, even a bull coming in silent to respond. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So where I set up is, it's kind of there's kind of a, um, it kind of falls off. The terrain does behind me going down away from the big draw. So um, the thermals were kind of already dropping a little bit because it's cloudy. Um, so um, I know that anything that responds in front of me coming up the main draw or coming down it are not going to get my win. So, um, you know, I just started, I started a little sequence there that, you know, um, being a turkey hunter, you know, I know that making sounds is one thing, but you have to say what you're wanting to communicate. That was the other thing I learned in the Academy so much, um, is the scenario based calling, um, you know, the language, uh, yep. things that I had never understood about, um, a rut. So, you know, you guys talked about in the podcast, a lot of times about getting into a rut and you talk about that in the Academy about how to paint a rut. So, you know, I've never experienced it early season because I've never hunted early season, but you know, heck you guys are hunting just South of the border in New Mexico and, Y'all are getting on bugle and elk early season and causing the rut to happen. Uh, like Luis has talked about, you know, saying, you know, do you ever feel like if we run the calls, can we trigger something in the animals? And I feel like that's what happens in turkey hunting. You know, mm -hmm. they may not be gobbling on any given day, but I can take a turkey diaphragm and go in there and gobble on that diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, we come back tomorrow, we're going to kill a turkey. I feel like it just triggers something in them. So anyway, your um, your academy really taught me how to paint what it really sounds like in a rut, not just going out there and making an elk sound, 
but how to put multiple sounds together to place the whole scenario. So that, that was like a real key for me mentally. And I think that, you know, going to Colorado, that was probably the knowledge that I learned um, is what caused me to have the attitude that I was really going to kill something, you know, the belief, the confidence, that's the word I'm looking for. The confidence that I was going to kill something was because I knew I went more equipped than I had ever gone before. Now we're going to have you continue telling this story, but I just want our listeners to know, you know, you've talked about doing a sequence and I think you're getting ready to talk about that as you go on. And we're going to come back to that at some point and have you actually do some demonstrations of what your sequence was and and the type of calls that you used. All right. Okay. Yeah. I set up, I start calling um, and I just start out with light muse, just some herd talk. Um, and I would, you know, I would run my calls for 45 seconds, a minute, minute and a half. And then I would wait for, you know, three or four minutes, five minutes. And then I would increase the volume a little bit, see if I get a response and then wait a few minutes. And then I would increase the intensity a little bit, see if I get a response. Okay. So we're going to have to do this, man. We have to do this. So grab your calls. I want to hear when you talk about your light. And we're just going to go through it as we're doing this here. So let's give okay. you the light muse with that sound and light. Now, now, if this was Luis, I want to tell you what this first call would sound like. Okay. Huh? <laughs> 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 uh. <laughs> like Manano over there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just light muse. And, and were you doing that amount of number like that? You know, I would, I would Bury continue it. just varying. I mean, a little cow chirps. Um, okay. Like, I tried okay. to vary the different sounds I was using, you know, whenever I would run a series of calls out. Now you said uh, you went up in volume, which we understand what that is. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're calling near to far, basically, right? Mm-hmm. You're doing a little softer. You're going farther. Then you said that you increased the intensity of it. Yes. So explain. Let's show that. What are you talking I about? Just, I just added a little bit of more emotion to the to the cow talk. You know, just a little bit more pleading uh, is. Now, and for our listeners listening, because this is great, and this is the reason we're doing this, because this is just, this is all value for everybody. They're not hearing us call. They're hearing somebody that has hunted elk now. This is their third time. He's been studying, he's been working, and he's understanding the concept of the difference between just when there's a mew happening and then all of a sudden where they're like getting a little more insistent and you can mm-hmm. hear that you can hear that insistence when he's talking hey hey yeah hey, hey well he hey, said it hey, more man. like a plead right yeah, uh-huh. yeah. wanting that hey, attention man. that uh awesome yeah. all right grinders tuning in thank you for listening to the blue collar elk hunting podcast Our goal is to share our knowledge and help you flatten that learning curve so that you too can have some of the very same incredible experiences that have given all of us here at Elk Bros a lifetime of memories. If you like what you hear or see, you can get all of this information plus so much more from our Base Camp Elk Hunting Training Camp, the first in a series of online courses from our Blue Collar Elk Academy. Our base camp training camp allows me to use my coaching style and share almost 40 years of elk hunting experiences successfully hunting elk on public lands as well as over 20 years guiding hunters of all ages and experience levels. This course will be like nothing you have ever experienced in concept and structure using success-based coaching techniques that will elevate your confidence and skill sets. Our camp will prepare you specifically from that final moment most in your control, those final minutes or seconds the elk is in front of you, backwards through each step and level, allowing you to see, 
visualize, understand, and relate every coaching point to what lies ahead, the next step, the next thought process, the next success. Because y'all, you've already been there. You know what it looks like. By tapping my 30 years of teaching and coaching experience, our camps are developed considering multiple learning modes with text, visuals, audio, as well as video. And base camp will benefit those new to elk hunting all the way to the 10 to 15 year vet. So if you are looking for that one thing to help you fill that tag this year, invest in the most important piece of equipment there is, you and your elk hunting knowledge. You can find the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Academy and the Base Camp Training Camp at elkbros.com. That's E-L-K-B-R-O-S dot com. Keep dreaming of the screaming, believing in achieving, and most of all, keep grinding. So, very good. <clears throat> After I would run through two or three series of cow calls, I would just let out just a little scream, nothing, you know, no lip ball, no chuckles, just a you know, really kind of a, a location bugle, um, not a roundup, just just let out a bugle trying to, to let another bull know that there was somebody talking to those ladies. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. And so um, I would do, I would run that same uh, scenario. Let them hear it, Stephen. Let them hear it. Let them hear it. You want to hear a bugle? Yeah, okay. absolutely, yeah. man. All right, we're we're going to get our full money's worth for these folks. <laughs> and he's Not trying to good. he's trying to keep his five children in in bed and you're asking him to bugle and make all this noise at the house man i bet his wife is really liking you right now yeah. joe <laughs> oh it's just dad uh, yeah but you got you forget he's been practicing now for how many meters oh yeah now the kid absolutely will, oh, he drives everybody out yeah, when, when yeah i practice when i drive to work you know yeah. but, i do that too yes. yeah yeah <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'm waking everybody up in the neighborhood. <laughs> I would just, once I bugled, I would usually follow that up pretty quick with some cow talk right behind that. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, the first scenario I just ran, I just bugled like that. Um, the second time I ran it, um, I think I just bugled at the end on that one also. And then the third time I ran it, um, I really wanted to paint that a rut was happening and, um, that was one thing that I really learned off the podcast, Joe, that you've taught us about is, um, is about the realism of adding in those moans and pants. Yeah. And I had never done yeah. that. And, um, you know, I just ran that whole scenario, started out light with cows, increased it, bugled, and then I went right back into some cows. And then after I did the cows again, I just started raking a tree and I mean, it was kind of cool. I was raking the aspen that I'm si standing beside and then there was a, um, a fir tree right behind me and I'm like, just going crazy on it, you know, beating it up. And as soon as I dropped my stick, I grabbed my grunt tube and started just some of those moans and pants uh -huh. and and whenever I got done with that, I turn around, my bow's on, my bow is sitting in front of me with my arrow knocked. And, um, you know, I'm just watching. And then, I mean, it's like, is this really happening? Because I can see mm. two tines just coming mm. up, you know, the, the <laughs> tops. And I'm like, holy crap, there is an elk right there. You know, just like you drew it up. Yeah. It's, it's happening just like that, you know. And so... You know, I know he's about 40 yards, and he's coming from my right to my left. Now, you know, I'm going to stop you again. So from the moment okay. that you started your first part of the sequence to this point, about how much time did that take? You know, it was probably an hour. I'd probably been there an hour. So I may have run my sequences more than what I'm thinking of before I started bugling. Mm -hmm. But I had been there at least an hour. Um, so just – you know, letting it play out. Um, it was my first evening. I didn't feel like I had to run around the woods oh. pushing something. It had been raining. And my woodsmanship, you know, that I've learned from where we hunt 
is that I, you know, with the sign that I'd seen, I felt like I was within an area that elk were going to hear me. Yeah. So, you let it you know, marinate, you gave it, the yeah. time. but I wanted people to understand that because a lot of times when you hear people saying, okay, I did these calls, I did these calls, and then I started screaming, I started raking, and there were the tips. Well, man, it sounds like, oh man, five minutes and he had these animals yeah. all over him, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, I, want, I want them to understand the commitment that you had, yeah. them, um, right? Okay. Yeah. So he's coming up, um, and as he's getting on the, the bench that I'm on, you know, I immediately can tell he's legal. I see his, you know, left front is huge. And um, so, I mean, you know, rarely does it happen the way you dream it's going to happen. Mm. But <laughs> he's walking from my right to my left. I look straight in front of me and there are three huge fir trees that are like side by side. And right past them is wide open. Draw, draw, like, there draw, is, <laughs> There is no way that this is going to happen, you know. So he's walking right toward him. He goes behind. I draw, and I shoot a, I shoot a two-pin slider. Um, and so I had my top pin set at 25. And when, when I slide, that's 25. My bottom pin's at 40. So, um, and I know he's going to be 33, 35 yards, something like that. Um they gapped him. And so whenever yeah, just gotta put just, that elk between the two pins. Yeah, he's just, you know, on a steady trail, you know, never stop, just he's looking for those cows. And um I mean it's just a matter of seconds and I'm at full draw. He walks out and when he did, um, you know, I just did a little bark at him instead of cow calling, because I've heard if you cow call they'll keep walking a few steps. So I, can. I just yeah. kinda quick barked at him and he stops broadside and Ooh. uh you know it's just i can just Getting remember seeing that right now <laughs> yeah i see that pin just coming up i knew i needed to hell hold high with my 25 and i don't you know i don't like necessarily gap shooting i like to watch where my pin sits you know so right. um i decided where i needed to put my 25 <clears throat> and um Man, there's just I can remember that pin settling and you know, being super focused when you shoot pins, Joe. I know you're not used to these pin deal yet, but on the pins, like whenever I get so focused, I only watch at that spot where that pin is. So I'm aiming high at twenty five, I squeeze the release, and I hear that just that hollow thump, you know, that we all love to hear. <sighs> and but the thing is, I'm looking at 25 and the bull's at 35. So my arrow dropped out of my sight from the point where I'm aiming at. Yeah. So, you know, I hear the hit. I know it's, you know, a pass through. So he whirls and it's just a few jumps and I can't see him anymore. You know, two it's holes, raining. baby. Two yeah. holes. <laughs> it's raining and I, you know, it had been raining earlier. So I can't hear him running off. Day and one. I'm standing there just flipping out, you know, this really just happened on opening day, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm standing there for a second and I'm like, all right, I didn't actually see the arrow hit. I heard it. It, the ground is completely soaked. So I'm going to walk over to my, you know, where he was standing and just check my arrow. You know, I've got to calm down a minute. You know, I've got <laughs> adrenaline exactly. going crazy. Yeah. So I walk over, check the arrow. Crazy. It is covered in blood, you know, and, Ooh, and it smells good. Funny. So I stand the arrow up in the dirt where he was standing and uh, I, I just look around and, you know, shooting these whitetails, you know, there's typically blood everywhere at the impact site. Mm -hmm. Well, shooting this elk, there's no blood there right at the impact side. So I'm like, all right, well, and I thought, well, I didn't hear him go down because everything's wet. So I'm just going to ease over to the, to the lip of the draw and see if I can see him. So I ease over there and I look to my left and I can see him standing about 70 yards. And so <laughs> I grab my range finder. I'm about to range him and I can, I can tell with the way he's doing his head that he's sick and he turns and just walks up the hill a little bit and about two steps, he gets behind some boulders and I can't see him anymore. So, you know, by this time it's, 
it's after seven o'clock, you know, it's not long until dark. And, um, I look around on the ground just right there where I was at and I, I don't see blood. So, you know, I just decided, you know, when in doubt back out, you know, it was going to be in the thirties that night. So, you know, I just made the decision to, to go back to my camp. I was about, Oh man, that's such a hard decision to yeah, make brother. Was, and I'm proud it that was you a, made it, you know, yeah. but it's just so hard. It just shows your yeah, maturity is. as an archer because it's just like the hardest yeah, thing terrible. to do. It's Especially terrible. when you have the arrow full of blood. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's, the but thing. you gotta make it. Yeah. yeah. I, um, you know, I, I've done this a long time. You know, I killed my first deer with a bow when I was 16 years old and, mm -hmm. and I've experienced uh, the highs and the lows just like sure. we all have. So, uh, yeah. with my first elk, I didn't want to take any chance. I knew that if he was dead right on the other side of that boulder where I last seen him, that He'll he be would there be in fine the in the morning. Yeah. Was it, and, was it still like looking like it was going to continue to rain? Yeah. See, that was the thing we were, it's hard. I didn't it makes know it how harder. much more it was going to rain. It was, overcast um so but I, I at least had my two points i had the point where i shot him the point where i last saw him and then when i walked over there the point i saw him there and where he walked to so i felt like you know with that information and and i was i was confident you know my pen was solid when i cut it loose so i knew where the arrow hit um you know with give or take just a little so um i just went to camp and and uh i just said i said a prayer basically all night you know <laughs> what was I, uh, that night like man yeah, it was, it was terrible man <laughs> pretty pretentious I mean, dude can't hardly in the sleep mountains and you just don't know you know yeah. i mean it's so what, what, was was that, again, what was the wolf, time what was the time when you shot it it was uh you know probably six fifty. you know yeah. somewhere right there right close to seven o'clock um mm -hmm. so there was still there was still a bit of daylight, but you know, I just, I did not want to get in there. Mm. You and, know, and, 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 you know, Luis, you said, you mentioned something that I want everybody else to, to hear and to think about as well, too, is that, you know, you, people are concerned a lot of times about bears and, um, you know, or something getting on the animal. <clears throat> Let me tell you that a good double lung hit gives you a whole lot better opportunity of an animal not getting on them than if you end up with a gut gotcha. shot yeah, that really gets that wrong. sent out like that. Right. Yeah. And you get those juices and I mean that it almost becomes like a dinner bell for some of those animals mm. out there. But I had a bull for, from one of my hunters that, you know, the one that I talked about, I looked for for three days. Yeah. And, yeah. and when I found that animal, not because it stayed in cool because it was a double, you know, because of the way the shot was and the way it landed, not letting out a whole lot, that animal, basically nothing had touched it in 30 some hours, man. Wow. It was wow. that cool there. And because it, it pretty much, you know, everything stayed within Deserved that. It. Yeah. So, yeah. No. So, I mean, the night, the night sucks, you yeah. know, oh, you, you're second guessing everything mm. and, you know, you know, you made a good shot and then you're like, man, how come he didn't fall? That's never mm -hmm. good. You know, um, you're like dead gummy, but you did the number one thing is always, you don't see him fall. You don't hear him gurgling and all that. It's just best. Like you said, to back out. And look, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, Chav and I, I put a shot on a bull one time and it was right at dark. I shot that bull. We heard him fall. We heard him gurgling and I still backed out and went to mm. camp. You know, I mean, we went back two miles back yeah. to camp, right? Mm. We, we hiked back to camp. We and got, we and got the mafia and the boys. And I said, listen, you know, I'm pretty sure he's down. We heard him fall and crash, but I didn't want to get in there and push him either. You know, yeah. So the only thing it, that would have made it right tougher for him, though, man, is is uh, the rain is sometimes a concern. No doubt. Yeah. You no know, doubt. That, and it's so a that, big, big that's concern. A, that's a tough call, man. But yeah. okay, so that's, you, that's why I was asking about the weather. Yeah. Yeah. So you're back and and you're trying to get a good night's sleep and yeah. <laughs> you text yeah, your wife. Gotta rest. What's that? Did you text your wife? Uh, yes. Text I any did. of your partners? Yeah. Yeah. I text my wife and um. I text my hunting buddy 
uh, from the Zodiac. Sweet. Let him know I got one and was going to have to track him up in the morning. So Sweet. I uh, I made I made myself stay in camp, you know, the next morning until it's full daylight. I mean, it was just – it was terrible, you know, just sitting there <laughs> waiting <laughs> in the gray light. You know, you're ready yeah. to go. But yeah, yep. I just – I didn't want to track him with a headlight. I wanted to wait till it was – until yeah. it was daylight, you know, yeah. so had me some mountain house breakfast and back up, you know, back up there I went. And I mean, it was just, I walked over to where my arrow was standing up and I looked at the ground again. There was still no blood there that wasn't there the night before. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I walked over to where I had been standing the night before and I looked down the ridge and I looked down and there's blood right by my feet. I'm like, Dad, gum! I was standing right, you know, basically yeah. right by it the night before. Just didn't uh, see it. Well, and, it gets uh, harder in that low light. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah, it gets harder so, in that low light. So, especially I, uh, for us boys, that are up around fifty. You know, I, I've also found <laughs> that sometimes, it, like, even if it's daylight, but I, I find my, I find it easier tracking blood with a, a strong flashlight when it's darker. Because for some reason, that strong flashlight just it, it highlights the blood quicker and it just focuses your eyesight to one See spot, where, like to the spot where you're aiming. So I don't know. I like, I really like, even during the day, if I'm tracking an animal, I'll bring my flashlight because it, uh, you it's just bright spot. enough to where it just it just helps you, especially if there's like a little shadow yeah, a lot or of the shadow. sun is high and, yeah. and something like that. It just it really helps. But Elements. yeah, I'm sorry, brother. I just wanted to yeah, yeah, share that's that. That's a good point though. So um, you know, I had the last point of reference. So I I followed the blood to where my last point of reference that I had saw him, and it was, you know, a decent blood trail. Um both so, so you went to behind the rocks where you lost him, right? Yeah, yeah. That's 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 where you found the blood trail, right no, there. No, it was right by. Like, where were Archer you standing? Sierra. In the yard. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Was, was there right a lot from... of blood uh, where you lost him, right behind those rocks when you got there? Yeah. So, okay. um, so he had gone <clears throat> parallel across the the draw, and then turned up, you know, back up, kind of the bench that I was on, but going across the hill, you know, north of me. Um, so pretty good blood up through there. Then once he gets on the bench um, that had been above me, it kind of started getting sporadic. So um, I pulled out my flagging tape and I just started, you know, hanging a piece of tape at every spot that I found blood and went, you know, 15, 20 yards like that and then kind of lost blood. And so um, I kind of had a feeling I knew where he was going. So I walked that out, you know, just 20 or 30, 40 yards, just looking, you know, trying to find that next spot of blood. Didn't find or it. the antlers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I didn't find that. Come back to my flag and tape. And, you know, I, I'm a man of faith and, and yep. the good Lord has helped me out in more ways than I can ever be grateful for, you know, and I took my hat off and, uh, you know, I just said a prayer, you know, I need some guidance here. You know, I can't do this on my own. Um, just, I really need your leadership in this that I, you know, I don't want to waste the animal and I want to, I want to make an ethical recovery. And, and I look at my flag and tape trail and I look in front of me and I walk about 10 yards and I go around uh, a, a, a spruce tree that was, you know, just really thick. And when I come around it, I walk right up on him. He's laying there dead, you know, about 20 wow. yards. I mean, yeah, it was just buddy. amazing. You know, I see within, this within 15 drunk. yards from where you 50, yeah. 40 yards. Yeah. I mean, from the last place I saw him to where he was laying was. I don't know, maybe, maybe 50 or 60 yards. It was just, was it wasn't done. very much at all. Oh. Just, you know how there's just a little bit of terrain there and then a little bit of cover and you come around it and you see that Joker laying there. It was just amazing. Man. Yeah. Congratulations. Well done. Yeah. Well what done, was my on the inside? What, what, what was coming out of you, man? Man, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know what was going to happen because 
I think I'm a little bit like Big O. I'm an emotional person. Oh, but I mean, like, yeah, I mean, I can't talk about much without getting yeah, a tear in my eye. You know, yeah. I mean, that's just who I am. And I'm. I was really wondering if I was going to break down, and I didn't expect that I was going to be the one screaming in the woods, mm. and I was not. <laughs> um, it was just so much. The first Joy. emotion was really relief. Joy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, yeah. I said my thank, thank you, Lord. Yeah. And, um, thank you, Jesus. And then I just, you know, I was just so humbled by the realization of a dream, you know, that's, you know, gone on for 16 years uh, to be able to walk over and put my hands on my first elk that happened the way I wanted it to, you know, on, in a place that I found, not somebody else's spot. It was my sure. spot, you know, sure. and just, I was just, I was just and really just yeah, just hard. overwhelmed with uh, Joy. gratitude, euphoria, and mm -hmm. just, you know, it was just amazing, Joe. Did you yell? I did not yell. I didn't yell in the woods. I just, man, I just, <laughs> took I was it just in. really humbled, man. Yeah, I mean, took I took it in. Yeah. yeah. Like, when you stand over that creature, man, you're very humbled. You know, yeah, I, you I didn't cry. I did not. I couldn't believe I like thought you. I probably would, yeah. but I was just, oh, I, I was just really absolutely oh. in all, you know. Yeah. Isn't that amazing though in that moment? How, you know, it's, it's almost like there should be so many things happening, so many things going on, all of this stuff, and it's just so quiet. Yeah. Yeah. All the raw yeah. emotion. It, oh, catches yeah, man. Up, it catches up with me. I mean, I know Quiet, the struggle, sure. you know, yeah. I know the struggle. I know how hard it is. I know how much work you put in. Uh, I know how much planning it goes into it. And for me, when I get around those big critters, I just get emotional. And, yeah. uh, and they're so majestic anyway. Uh, I thank the good Lord for putting them on this earth for us to have and to use and to have to eat. I absolutely, I had some last night. I absolutely love eating elk meat. I mean, it's yeah. my favorite thing to eat, you know, and, uh, I, I, I thank the animal, you know, uh, Luis and Manano always pray over their animals. And I, you know, I felt a, a kinship with that too. And I, you know, we say a prayer and thank God for, for the animal, you know, and, yeah. uh, it's uh, and thank God for the ability to be live in oh, the country man. where we live and have the ability to do what we do. Be um, healthy to do it. And yeah, be healthy. Uh to to it's just a jubilation of, of thanks. It's a true thanksgiving when you stand over one yeah. of those oh, yeah. uh magnus magnificent creatures. Uh, because you really don't know how big they are until you walk up on them on the ground and you go, man, who you, oh my you God. are alone in the mountain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. That now the realization work was, uh, that was quickly realized, you know, <laughs> it's all fun and games until the pictures yeah. are done taken. And then, then it's like, it's real, like, okay, it's time yeah. to get after it. Oh, yeah. even for the picture taken, man, when you try to uh, smooth oh, that thing God. around for yeah. the right angle. Yeah. After one day. Yeah. yeah. It, it got real at that point, didn't it? Yes, it did. So do, do I mean, do we have pictures, Joe? And, and while he's telling the story, I'm going to go, I'm going to go find these. And, uh, and, and so I'll where, where did you end up hitting him, Stefan? Oh, it was just right in the 12 ring, you know, at gotcha. lower I third a, or middle. Yeah, it was lower third. That's what um, took him a little. I while. would have liked to have been, you no, know, or three inches higher, maybe. But, um, you know, just it, it did exactly what Joe said. Um, I got two holes, but one side ended up plugging, and mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. why I didn't have as good a blood trail. So as not as a full blood pass blood. through. Oh yeah, it was full pass through. Meaning, just, just the off side, the flap, uh, the skin. Like whenever he run, it just covered it up, you know, yeah. it come out right behind the crease. I got it. I got so, it. So, so the, the so arrow, it. the arrow completely was like, you found, yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, you yeah, found no, the no, arrow and yeah. you put it on yeah. the ground. What, yeah, yeah. What broadhead were you shooting, brother? I was shooting a slick trick, uh Viper trick. Viper. And, and that, again, that's something again, to reinforce that absolutely in that lower third in that in that golden triangle all those areas man that animal is going to die yeah. however the issue with that can be 
you know, that, some time. That, that shoulder skin and stuff like that, especially mm-hmm. with the pass through, or even if the arrow's in there and it gets clipped off by an arm. So yeah, you know, and that, it, that's just something just to keep in that head, man, you hit that mid body, you get up there three, four inches behind there. And yeah, it, it, it helps you out with that. But mm-hmm. man, dude, I mean, you're there and, Crazy and, awesome. the, and, and let me do this. Let's show everybody. Um, what this this is this is his bull oh check him out brother oh i remember oh, this picture. Nice. Oh, yeah i That's remember right. seeing this picture yeah what sir. a cool bull man my daughter would be so jealous she loves bulls like that man yeah man. let's uh let's let's really take All a look at this, and everything, this is the man. picture that i like man right here yeah <laughs> oh wow Absolutely. yeah i remember these what, pictures what, what were so you doing cool. what were you doing stuff i was coming out heavy Joe. coming <laughs> out heavy man <laughs> yeah. Yeah. absolutely wow. yeah that was and, so cool and here's the yeah. neat here's a neat part of this story too is is when he was talking about that earlier you had an encounter with a grouse hunter yeah. and I mean, a lot of people could have taken that. Here's a guy with a dog. He's got a gun. And it's like, oh, man, why am I even here, man? <laughs> and yet, you know, you turn that negative into a positive. And how did that pay off for you or did it? Well, it is, uh, man, it just restored my faith in humanity. Um, so whenever I was getting ready to cut him up, I text uh, the man that I had met and said, hey, I I got a bull last night and, uh, and he said, Oh, that's cool. And he sent me the outfitter's number to see if he wanted to help pack him out. And I text the outfitter and he said, uh, he said, man, I'm sorry, but I'm fully booked on guided clients. I said, Hey, it's no problem. You know, I'm just about three and a half miles from the truck. I will, uh, you know, I'll get him out. It won't be no problem. <clears throat> and, um, so what I did was is, you know, it took me, took me right at two and a half close to three hours to from the time i started quartering him to get him in the game bags Mm -hmm. and what i did was i i took uh some logs and stacked together uh under some spruce trees and each time i'd fill a game bag i'd stick them on those you know one end on each of the logs so there would be airflow under them in the shade um i got him all worked up and I packed the first hind quarter down to my spike camp and I come back up and loaded up the second hind quarter. And for whatever reason, it was just on my back feeling good. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to go all the way to the truck with this one. So I get, um, I don't know, I'm probably a mile and a half from the truck, maybe two miles. And I got a text from that guy that I had met. What about the elevation? He's going down. I shot him at. He's going down. I shot here. him at uh, like ten one hundred, right at ten thousand, something like that. And so I'm, you know, I'm a couple of thousand feet above the truck, but it's just all downhill. So that was, you know, really a blessing. But at um, the same time, everybody, man, sticks can really help out here because going down yes. oh, yeah, more uh, dangerous than going up. Down. Yes, and I did have trekking poles with yeah. me, so. There you go. Um, he but makes anyway, them, he, he texts me and he said, um, hey, my wife and I are on the way out. We're going to help you pack your bowl out. Wow. Oh, man, and that's sweet, dude. It had Made started raining again. Oh. And I said, look, man, y'all don't have to come up here. I said, I'll probably just spend the night at camp tonight. I said, it's raining or at my truck. I said, it's raining and nasty. Y'all really don't have to come up here. And he said, we'll be at the trailhead in 40 minutes. And How cool. I got to the truck and, wow. and I was sitting there drinking a the Gatorade and he pulled up and, um, and he, you know, I was, I'm going to tell you, I was wore out and I was not, I, in all honesty, I wasn't looking for that hike back up in there that night, but, um, you know, they showed up and I said, well, let's go. And we walked back in there and, um, man it's just it's just crazy you know they live at the elevation so they're a lot more efficient at that than what i am and but his wife helped you pack out too man i'm gonna tell what you she had a she had a big pack we put a front shoulder in her pack uh-huh. wow. she said no problem we wow. put um, a <laughs> shoulder in my pack and then 
the other guy, we put the uh, trim bag in his pack and we head back down to my spike camp. And he's like, man, this thing don't weigh nothing. He said, I think I'm going to take that other hind quarter in this bag. And I'm like, you really think so? He's like, yeah. <laughs> so wow. we loaded his pack up <laughs> and he's like, uh, you're going to have to help me pick it up. Sound like the so, flatlander. <laughs> Yeah, the yeah. two of us got that pack up, and he got it on his back. And I said, well, look, y'all, I'm wore out. I'll get there when I get there, but I'll see you at the truck. And I'm literally telling you, within minutes, they walked off and left me. I mean, I watched their headlights <laughs> disappear in the dark. That's like my nano brother. He's like all-wheel drive when he gets a pack on his back. He's out. Yeah, it's like, so, dang, man, that dude is – Guys like that are just animals, man. Yeah. You know, so, so cool got, to have them in your camp, though, buddy. I got back to the truck at midnight, and we had that whole elk out in one day. It was just – it was really amazing the the kindness of somebody to you know, help you. Yeah. come out of their house, bring their wife, and him. hike up the mountain. Yeah, just just good people. And hope you stay in touch with them today. I was going to say, it opens it up for a life yeah. – long lifetime friendship, friendship man. absolutely yeah. so i got to i got to pay it back uh a couple of days later he had um he said hey you want to go turkey hunting and i said absolutely you know because i've i've killed how oh, cool is this this is just getting better again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so he's like well i know a place that's got some turkeys up here and i said well i don't need to you know i'm not gonna buy a tag but i'll go with you and help you call you know and I always have turkey calls in my truck. Yeah. So we go over to this um, this other piece of BLM that's west of where they live. And that afternoon we're driving around. We got to see a monster mule deer buck. Um, we're driving around this property. And he said, what you do is, you know, we'll spot them near these ponds and we'll just get out and hunt them. I said, all right. And he had never called one up, you know, so, uh -huh. um, so we're driving around this spot and I spotted something way down the road. Uh, I said, just park the truck. We'll see what it is. Well, I got the monoculars out and it was a cow and a calf down there. I said, well, you know, I've got my calls. We'll just go down there and I'll teach you a little bit about elk hunting and calling. And so you can understand it stalking. Um, so, you know, I, I got a little thistle there and showed him how to watch for the thermals and and we ended up slipping down there and we got about 60 or 70 yards from that cow and the calf so that was pretty cool to get to you know teach him about that like i say he's really new to elk hunting and hunting period and so these this cow and the calf they were going up the hill and that cow kept looking back down the hill and i knew there was something on the other side of that pond bank and um uh, we let them walk off and and i'm like man there is something around there and you know he's new to hunting he just goes walking around the end of the pond bank and he's like oh there's turkeys right there you know <laughs> and they take off running up the hill i'm like man you gotta be kidding me so yeah. uh we eased around the hill i got to call in a little bit and i said you know what we need to get on up this hill away from where we just called them from and we eased up there a little bit and he spotted them he ended up getting to take a a nice young Tom. And so it was cool. Oh, cool. You know, wow. Be able to pay him cool. back a little something there. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. What a great story. Yeah. This is just and, it, and that's what it's all about. No doubt. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Like you said, man, wow. you know, like you could have got real aggravated with that dude and never said a word to him. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, but because you, but because you were humble and said, Hey man, you know how hey. things going. And that guy was cordial with you. you I know, struck up a little conversation. Not only did you, you you know ha have a an ally in your back pocket when you knock a bull down now you got a friend for life that's right you know? and that's mm -hmm. something man and and people don't realize that you know a lot of these people you just treat them with kindness man and it's amazing you know especially people living there they'll give you information they'll help you out maybe they don't but what is the yeah. loss of that of you being kind to another human yeah. being Exactly. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's it. Was what a super and, and, story. And that was a rare feature, right? A, a guy just, you know, walking with a golden retriever and a 22 in the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> Old boy out there grouse hunting with his 22. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. awesome. So, 
How much do your arrows weigh? Uh, they weigh 492, and they're shooting at 287. So on, on your 16-year journey, man, and, and really, I would say that – In Matthews, I think your hat says Matthews on it, though. Yeah. Right? That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> V3. <laughs> oh, oh, you got the V3? Hey, yeah, brother. I, nice. I, I've, I've got a – I'll get the V3X – Oh okay. <laughs> uh oh, here we go. We're going into bow point. Yeah. Anyway, okay, now you're now you're really getting to know Monano. No the quiet hunter in the background. <laughs> don't know him. <laughs> so, well, let me ask you, Stefan, man, in this journey and, and everything that happened here, what would you say the keys were this third time out that that were so different than the first two times? You know. Um, the first thing was just the, the real change of attitude. Um, I really went from the time I left home, I expected that I was going to bring an elk home. I expected that I was going to kill something. And, you know, I knew, I knew my gear was working, you know, exactly the way it should. My, my bow was shooting fantastic. My arrows are flying straight. So, you know. What you're the, saying is so important. And I think because, you know, it's easy. I've always heard it's like, oh, you're just going to the woods thinking you're going to get something, right? And I was like, well, that's easy yeah. set, easier said than done, right? And yeah, stay but, real fast. But don't all of that has to be aligned. Like all, everything that you said, it just, you know, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, like your confidence is built on the work that you've put on the, on the front end. Yeah. Right. Again, your preparation. The the real thing for me, you know, and, and I've you know messaged Joe about this in the past, but I have used other learning methods that you know I learned something from, you know, before I went in 2019. Sure. Um but just the way that the information from the uh, base camp is delivered for my learning style, you know, it's more than just reading something and trying to comprehend what you're reading. Um, it's reading it in a way that to me is immediately applicable when I walk into the woods and I agree. being able to understand what the calling scenario is talking about and being able to put that place whenever I get into the timber, um, being able to understand, you know, Joe's explanation of those, those knuckle areas. I mean, you know, where we hunt here at home, um, you know, when you find areas on your properties, whether it's a, you know, a pinch point or a bench oh, mm -hmm. or whatever, you learn a terrain feature right. that, that those animals use, uh -huh. you better pay attention to that when you go somewhere else to hunt. So, yeah, you know, when it's I applicable listen to everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, when I listen to, you know, Joe talk about those knuckle points and I'm looking on my e-scouting and I see those, you know, I know that, that I need to pay attention when I'm in there looking for the sign, looking at the terrain, um, you know, I just, I really felt like the knowledge that I took to the woods with me this year was so much greater than what I had in the past. Um, that all just led to the confidence that, um, that, you know, if I get a response that I'm going to be able to do something with it. Um, the stop and scan that you guys hammer home. I can't tell you how critical that is. Like I told you on my first elk hunt, I called a bull in. The very first elk that I ever heard bugle, I called him to 72 yards, and he walked right out of that timber, walked into the park, stopped there broadside. You know, Where and, are you? Where are yeah, you? Yeah, if that were today at? at 72 yards, I'd have let the air out of him. But yeah. back then, I didn't shoot like I do now. Um, mm -hmm. And I just didn't have that opportunity. But the stop and scan was really important whenever I was actually setting up, you know, to be in the woods, knowing you're hunting, knowing you're fixing to put yourself 
in a position, whether you're going to get a shot or don't, and to know that if it happens, that you're close enough, you're fixing to get a shot. Yeah. That was critical for yeah. me. Um, you know, just just you mentioned, you know, you, you mentioned something about the academy of, you know, you know for your learning style. Mm-hmm. I think the beauty of the academy is that it's, it's you know, Joe has done it in such a way that you know, it kind of adapts itself to different learning styles you right. know, because it's got <clears throat> the visuals, it's got the pictures, it's got the interaction, mm-hmm. it's got the written portion mm-hmm. and it has, you know, the video portions as well, narrating, you know, what's written as well. So yeah. like I'm, I'm more of a listening and seeing than actually reading uh, yeah, you're, type you're learning really style than and uh and it 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 works it works for me right yeah you know know, so it it it, i think it's it's uh we did so cool the way you've done you built it joe because it 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 just adapts itself and and he he followed the slow play to a t right i mean Mm -hmm. he followed that rut sequence to an absolute t and when you do that we we say this all the time i mean it's how i killed my bull this year too and we just it took him that long to get there. You know, mm-hmm. it took him an hour to find us finally. Right. Yeah. And uh, do what Bubba they're traveling in their time. Not yeah. A- they're traveling in their time. One of the things that you did so well was have that kind of patience mm-hmm. and know that the scenario you're putting on is, is right. You know, and you believed in the scenario and you invested the time. A lot of guys, if they don't hear something or they don't, see something within 10 minutes they roll it and they'll either blow up something walking through it or they left them behind them you know what i mean so your your patience and i'm not gonna say you're inexperienced but your inexperience of doing this gave you the patience you just you just said it i'm telling you i've been a thousand times with joe we've sat in a scenario for 10 or 15 minutes and we we, you know we just keep right on rolling because you know we we're in some in some areas that are hot with elk and stuff like that well Mm -hmm. you didn't know i mean you knew you had some sign but you sure didn't know how many bulls were around you but all it takes is one right and and that's what happened and then I tell you the two big takeaways I got from this is once you got him in, you let him pass an obstacle before. You, did you draw while he was behind the obstacle or after he passed the obstacle? Yeah, as soon yeah. as his head started to go behind. Because he I had three. Yeah. He had that perfect situation, yeah. and he had. Yeah. And, uh, and that's that, that's awesome, you know. Yeah, but, it was like a complete screen. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. luckily, and stopping, he kept walking. stopping it, stopping yeah. it to actually, you know, settle your pin. Yeah, I mean, it, that, it, again, the, that's the other thing is yeah. once he walked clear of the the obstruction, right? Yeah. And, and there's so many times, man, that you draw when they're behind that obstruction, they stop. And it's like yeah. now, yeah. now I'm holding right, but you actually drew, and he kept with the script. He kept rolling, right? He kept walking, looking for whatever it was. And then when he pops out and he gets to the clearing where you, you know, you're there, settle your pen and you, you bark at him. He stops and looks right at you. Uh, A a lot of guys won't do that. They'll just shoot at him walking and that's no, no, you know, that's a big no, no. Cause they take a big gate. Yeah. Depending on how close he is and how slow he's walking. But me, I, I just, yeah, if yeah, he was really it. close like that, it'd be, you know, if he's at that eight yard. I, I like what you mentioned about the bark versus yeah. the, the cow call because I, I'm, I've always been a cow call guy to stop. Yeah, him, because, stop uh, you know, I, I did the cow call this year and I actually, you know, playing the video, I the comment you made exactly what happened. I mean, that 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 bull didn't really stop. It's just like he turned, but he kind of kept on, mm-hmm. you know, making a few steps right after I cow called. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's mine pretty did cool, too, man. But I had to be insistent with mine. You know, yeah, and the other thing is, so I want to go back to just highlight the maturity that he had displayed as an archer. You not only on the before portion, but on the after portion. And I think I think that was key for him to being able to, um, you know, recover that animal on the following day. You know, and, and yeah, probably a really good shot, but. You made one of the hardest decisions an archer can make, and you made it. You know, that bull. You follow. You follow the script to the T. Yeah. 
that bull that bull could have easily if you depressed him because it was raining that bull could have yeah. easily got up and went another mile without yeah. expiring they get that, that adrenaline dump man they can go a long way and with that with that flap closed up on the other side, super yes, hard sir. to follow him that far. And if they you know? do it as scared with big yeah. jumps, you're Ooh, not, yeah, it's hard to find blood in between the you steps. Did the, you did the perfect. right thing, man. I mean, perfect. That's why you stood over him with your hands on him, brother. Congratulations. Yeah. 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 Congrats. yeah. yeah. You followed a lot of, a lot of the things to a T uh, and you were, you were aggressive, but patient. Yeah. Yeah. You know, those are yeah. two big keys. Yeah, and I mean, and that's a great point that Chad makes because we always talk about being aggressive. There's aggressive and there's intelligent, man, and there's aggressive in your patience. I mean, there's, you know, all of that, man. It and all- there's dumb and there's Manano. I mean, it's just like, it's just like everything. <laughs> I, we're about to lose Manano. He's getting lower and lower in the video. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> he doesn't even know what we're talking about right now. He has no idea what we're saying. Yeah. Well, guys, uh, and, you know, gosh, thanks so much for the story. Um, oh, yeah. Generally, in this time, we go to our Elk Bros mailbox, but this was such a great story and so much cool conversation. Yes. Um, it's not going to happen, but I want everybody to know that we've got Timothy Jackson from Michigan, and, and we have Lance Mead from Elizabeth City, North Carolina. We have Jason from Raleigh, North Carolina. <laughs> you just to hear what these questions are because this is what we're going to hit on our next show here um where one guy has you know timothy's talking about he struggled um you know on his hunt he's gone twice one day for seven days one for five days um pretty much hiked with his his bow got so frustrated he gave up the second time and his question is should i give up on hunting elk on my own and hire a guide what would you do in my case and he said he doesn't call in these things so that question is coming up lance mead brings one up when he said he heard us talking about decoys in September in Colorado, but he said, couldn't that be a safety concern in Colorado with the muzzleloader season overlapping? So that's going to be a great question we're going to have there. Yeah. And here was one. Here's one of the reasons that, that we just can't get into this right now. tonight. <laughs> Jason from Raleigh, North Carolina said, how do you even begin to pick a state to hunt elk? Which is a great question. <laughs> no doubt in a big conversation that could almost be a podcast in itself. And, uh, you know, one thing I I want to remind everybody, those are yet to come. Um, But, you know, one thing that Stefan talked about was his thanks. And we all talk about a lot of times our thanks for a lot of different reasons. And um, when this podcast comes out in a few days, a lot of us will be with family celebrating our Thanksgivings in our homes with a lot of our loved ones. And, um, you know, just so that I make sure that before Gilbert takes us to the closing here, that we don't forget this. We want to thank each and every one of you for spending the time that you do with us. We want to thank all of you that are out there in the woods celebrating this lifestyle, helping others to have incredible experiences as well, or stepping outside your comfort zone like Stefan did here and making a friend that ends up becoming somebody that could be a friend for life. And it's amazing how those things come back to you. And the thankfulness that we have when we stand over one of our harvests for the life that it gave in the honor of the hunt so that we can share that in our homes and we will be that food, that harvest with all of our family members and friends and neighbors as well. So, you know, we just want to make sure at this time that, uh, you know, this is a tough time in the world right now, but a lot of us, let's um, hope and pray that we're more the solution than the problem and really celebrate all these wonderful things and the wonderful people we have in our life. So just a happy Thanksgiving from myself and from us bros to all of y'all. Amen, brother. Well said. Amen. Very well said, Joe. Guys, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe, rate, and review. You got to go to Apple Podcast or iTunes to review us. And you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com. And just a reminder, if any of our listeners would like their questions answered on our show, just send your questions to info at elkbros.com. That's info at elkbros.com. And like we say down here in the Lone Star State, husbands kiss your wives, wives kiss your husbands, hug your babies, keep your broad heads 
sharp and your powder dry. And we'll see you next week right here on Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Happy peace, thing. peace, 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 everybody. Oh, and guess and what? For all our grinders oh. out there, that's right, Joe. Tell them what's up. Absolutely, man. More music from our brother, Tony Wintrup. Whoop, whoop. Way to go, Tony. I got a whole bag of tricks for five by fives and six by six. Whether there's snow or a bit of rain, all that mountainous terrain. I got a pair of boots that fit just right, and Phelps calls get them close to my side. When I pull the string and I watch that carbon hit, I just elk it. Man, I just elk it. I just elk it. I waited 350 days. I watched the wind blowing from my old ways. And I watched the path that he walked in the fall. And there's no failure in my head when all I'm tracking is red. With the fist pump to the sky when the beast is dead. I just elk it. Oh man, I just elk it. I just elk it. like a baseball bat his body's as big as a rodeo bull i'm a cowboy on his back i slip the buck knife under his skin i quarter him up with a big old grin and i feel the pack with the gold that i'm gonna be eating i just elk it oh man i just elk it i just elk it This rack is turning heads upside down. The cooler's on and he's gonna start chilling on down, down, down. I just elk it. Man, I just elk it. Oh, I 